so. Okay, pleasant good morning, everyone. So today we'll be looking at both the endocrine system and nutrition. With the endocrine system, we'll be looking at the glands and hormones, which are responsible for maintenance of our body through homeostatic means. Additionally, we'll be looking at nutrition. And when we look at nutrition, one of the highlights of the nutritive process will be examining glycolysis, the breakdown of sugars, as the name implies, glyco, uh, referring to glucose and lysis meaning cutting. So glycolysis, breakdown of glucose, when it is broken down, it generates two molecules of pyruvate at the substrate level phosphorylation, which occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell anaerobically. Next, these pyruvate, they're shuttled across to the mitochondria to undergo aerobic respiration. And within the mitochondria itself, uh, you do have at the level of the cytoplasm, you have the Krebs cycle occurring, which generates two ATP, then the uh, electron transport chain located on the inner matrix of the mitochondrial membrane that generates approximately 34 to 36 ATP. So collectively, approximately, when we look at the breakdown of one glucose, collectively, 38 ATP is generated um, at the level of both aerobic and anaerobic respiration uh, within the cytoplasm of the cell and also within the mitochondria. We look at that in a little more detail once we finish looking at the endocrine system. So let's start off with the endocrine system, shall we? Okay, great. So when we look at the endocrine system, endocrine system collectively, it consists of both glands and hormone. And it's a group of glands that produce these hormones and they work with the nervous system to control and coordinate all other body systems. So in terms of how they affect the change, they affect body system through chemical means. And then this effect changes, which occur at the level of the glands themselves. So what are some of the um, effects that occur because of the hormones. Now these hormones by nature, they're chemical messengers. And when they are secreted, some effect that they may have on tissue one, you have growth hormone, thyroid hormone and insulin. And how they actually regulate specific tissues is important to remember that these hormones are secreted in the blood and the blood, it passes through the blood, it goes throughout the entire cardiovascular system. And in this way, it reaches virtually every cell in the body because it travels through the cardiovascular system. So the question is, okay, how is it then that a particular hormone is recognized by the specific group of cells associated with an organ? If you're looking at thyroid, let's say thyroid simulating hormone. Excuse me, sir. I don't want yes. to touch, but um, two people in the waiting room right now trying to get into class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Right. So how is it then that specifically these, um, the hormone affects change in a particular organ? If you're looking, let's say, at the thyroid. The thing is, they're specific, there's specificity. Remember, in terms, most, as we'll just see, in terms of the structure of these hormones, most of them, they're either uh, lipid, uh, they have lipid structures associated with them or they're proteinaceous in structure. These hormones are recognized by specific receptors which are located on the organs itself. So that's why even though the hormone, it goes and it is distributed systematically within or throughout your entire cardiovascular system, specificity occurs on the organ itself because of the fact the organ has receptors only for this type of hormone. So that's how, uh, even though it is broadcast and it travels all throughout the body, it will only cause an effect, let's say in this case, um, on the thyroid gland, because there are specific receptors that recognize it. And that's why it's the equivalent of, let's say if you're looking at high street, you're walking down high street, let's say on a crowded day, as it did exist in the past, 
there are lots of people walking all over the place, walking up and down High Street. But let's say you are walking down and you see your friend, your friend, and you're, hey, Janine, how long I see you? You recognize your friend, right? Now, mark you, Janine was walking up and down High Street all the time, but nobody was really recognizing her. It's only you recognize her because you know what she looks like. You know, she has a particular length of nose. She wears a particular type of clothes. And particularly when you look at the face, you could see and identify it. In a very similar manner, that's what happens in the body as related to the release of hormones. Hormones are released. And yes, it, going, it goes throughout the whole body. Yeah, it passes the uh, thyroid, passes the spleen. It goes all throughout the body. Nothing happens. It only is recognized when it reaches particularly the thyroid because there are receptors there that recognize that particular hormone. And when it, what you have happening, binding of the hormone to the receptor, and then it affects a change. All right, so in terms of the chemistry of these hormones, uh, there are two uh, makeups. One, you have amino acid and lipids in terms of their structures. Amino acids, of course, are the components of proteins. And then you have the lipids, more of fatty acids. One of the things with these lipids, they are mostly found on steroid type hormones. Right? And steroids, they are derived from steroid cholesterol. Steroids, one of the things that you would recognize in your professional career as you go along, steroids are very important in terms of regulating swelling. So when you do have issues relating to swellings in particular, or abnormal growth, steroids are usually administered to control that. All right, let's have a question here. Hormones from the sex glands are made up of what? Amino acids? lipids or proteins? Hmm. Well, it, more likely than not is amino acid compound, but in truth and in fact, it is indeed lipids. So the sex hormones, very importantly, testosterone, estrogen, for instance, they are made up primarily of lipids. Now, how are these things regulated? Right? Because yes, they are sent off, but how are they regulated? Most of the hormones are regulated by a negative feedback mechanism. As opposed, the only one that I could think of that is regulated by positive feedback. Anybody has a, um, it has a clue which one it is? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with reproduction and then getting little Charlie out of the womb and into the world. There's a particular hormone associated with that. Contractions. Oxytocin. Oxytocin, thank you very much. Yeah, so oxytocin, that's the only one that is positive feedback. And what do we mean by positive feedback? When the time comes and oxytocin is secreted, it causes uterine contraction. And the more oxytocin that is present is you get more uterine contractions. And the more contractions you get is the more uterine, uh, oxytocin is secreted. So therefore it feeds upon itself. Once it recognizes that hey, it's time for little Charlie to come out, contraction, contraction, and it just keeps going on and on. Whereas with a negative feedback mechanism, what happens is this. So it recognizes that there's a, some deficit or something like that, needing secretion of a particular, um, let's say chemical. So what happens is the hormone is released and it causes, let's say, at the level of the thyroid. It causes thyroxine to be uh, released. Thyroxine is, is released. Now, there are sensors in the body that detect levels of the hormone, of this particular hormone. When it recognizes that it has reached optimal level, what it will start to do, it's a negative feedback mechanism. So that more, when it sees more, it begins to reduce it. It recognizes, look, it has reached the optimal level. Let's reduce the secretion of thyroid stimulating hormone and by extension thyroxine and that is how a negative feedback mechanism works the one of the easier ways to remember it is by looking at what happens with your air condition unit for example so let's say you set it at 19 degrees Celsius. So what happens is the compressor switches on. And of course, it, the temperature within the room begins to get lower and lower. When it does reach 19, however, uh, it is the sensors in the AC, it picks it up or detects it, and it then sends a signal to the compressor telling it to cut off. So that's how sometimes when you're um, you know, in your room, you would hear your compressor on the air conditioning unit cut off. 
right? That means it has reached its optimal uh, level and it agrees with the input that you put in. In this case, let's say 19 degrees Celsius. All right, so uh, this is showing here the negative feedback control of hormones. So in this case, thyroid screening hormone is released. And of course, it affects or causes effect on the thyroid gland. Well, it's, so you have this hormone constantly being released. And eventually, once it reaches a certain level, it causes inhibition of the thyroid uh, stimulating hormone to be released. It not only causes that, it acts at the level of the hypothalamus itself and decreasing that hormone that stimulates the release of uh, TSH. Right? So the signal itself causing TSH release, that is affected, and also directly TSH secretion itself. So at two levels, you have it occurring, and ultimately that leads to, leads to the reduction of the thyroxine stimulate, uh, release. So that is one example. Now let's have a look at the, the endocrine glands themselves. So where are they located throughout your body? And you'll be well placed um, this diagram to take note of the different endocrine hormones throughout the body. Um, this is a fan favorite. It comes in many different forms and fashions all the time. Okay, let's have a closer look. So you have the pineal gland uh, located in the brain and you have the pituitary gland as well. The thyroid gland, parathyroid, thymus located uh, on laterally on either side of the trachea. You have the adrenal glands very important for the secretion of adrenaline, as the name implies, and they are found at the top or superior portion of the kidneys themselves. The pancreatic islet, islet sorry, important for the secretion of insulin. Insulin, important for the regulation of sugar within the body itself. And you have the ovaries and females and testes and males. And this is important uh, for the sex hormones to be released. Let's have a look at the pituitary. Now, the pituitary gland, right, which is located uh, right here on the brainstem, the pituitary gland is considered the master gland, and it is controlled by the hypothalamus. It releases hormones that affect the working of other glands. So it's very important whenever you hear the word master gland or the controller, think about the pituitary gland itself. So in terms of the effects, um, how, how it is or which glands are affected by different hormones, let's see if we could have a look. All right, so at the level of the pituitary, here it is here, you are, it consists of two parts, the posterior and the anterior, and there are specific hormones which are controlled by both the posterior and anterior pituitary as shown here. So what are some of these hormones which are controlled? Well, you have thyroid secreting hormone, you have ACTH, uh, follicle simulating hormone, which controls both um, estrogen and progesterone, testosterone, which controls the sexual maturation of in within males. Here you have growth hormone important for both bone and tissues, because without it, uh, you wouldn't have, you would just, which is how you could have um, pituitary dwarfism. When you don't have the hormone being released, the person remains as a little person. Then you have prolactin, important for um, both milk, eject, milk drop drawdown and also for um, breast development. You have antidiuretic hormone, very important for the kidneys, and water regulation. Um, we, very important. It is important at that level because antidiuretic, as the name implies, diuretic, something that makes you want to give off urine or water, lose water. So the antidiuretic hormones actually causes water retention in the body itself. So it does come into play in particular when you go through a period or a time when you there's need for you to retain water. So let's say if you're very you're going through a desert or something like that, you will not want to be giving off water. ADH comes into play. Oxytocin, mentioned that as well in terms of uterine contraction and of course development of the breast. All of these are 
occur at the level of the posterior pituitary, uh, specifically on this side from prolactin all the way up to oxytocin, and then from thyroid stimulating hormone to growth hormone, those are from the anterior pituitary. All right, so in terms of the pituitary itself, here it is, how is it controlled? Well, the control starts at the level of the hypothalamus, where it sends releasing hormones, either RH or the inhibiting hormones, and these either stimulate uh, and suppress the anterior pituitary secretions. So you, this leads to the production of ADH and oxytocin, which are stored in the posterior and nerve impulses stimulate the secretions. So here it starts at the level of the hypothalamus, and then you have stimulation here leading to the effect occurring at the level of the anterior and posterior pituitary glands. So stimulation along these pathways cause the release of these different hormones. So what part of the brain con controls the pituitary? If I were to ask that, what part of the brain controls the pituitary? Well, it would be the hypothalamus. Let's talk about the anterior lobe now. So for the anterior lobe, in terms of the hormones that are released, you have growth, thyroid stimulating or TSH, adenocorticotrophic hormone, prolactin and the gonadotropins, GTAPG. Could somebody think of a word in which we could remember the hormones of the anterior lobe? A word with these letters, GPATG. All right. Best one I can think about is you go to the, um, a movie to go to see, you go to South Park and you're going to see a movie called Tag and it's rated PG. So you have T-H-E-P-G. -E -G. Um, that's the best I can do <laughs> as it relates to those. Now, so that's the anterior lobe. In terms of the posterior lobe, you have ADH and oxytocin. All right, so remember going to see the movie Tag, it's rated PG, thyroid stimulating, adenocotrophic, and gonadotropins, and then the PG will stand for prolactin and the growth hormone. What are the hormones from the anterior? Oh, let me hear you. Tag PG, and the posterior will be AO, right? The antidiuretic and oxytocin. Both of them have to deal with fluids. So think about it that way. Um, in terms of urine, urine control is under um, ADH, and of course, oxytocin, we're talking about, ut well, uterine contractions, but also drawdown of milk at the level of the breast. Let's go now to the thyroid gland. Now, the thyroid is the largest gland in the endocrine gland in the body and lateral robes on either side of the larynx. Let's have a look at what it looks like. Here's our good friend, uh, the hyoid bone, the larynx, and here you have the thyroid gland. So you have the thyroid lobes right and left, and you have the isthmus in between them. Of course, the trachea runs underneath both of them. So specifically, what hormones are associated with the, the thyroid gland? Well, you have thyroxine, triiodothyroxine, and calcitonin. Thyroxine, it increases energy and protein metabolism rate. Thi triiodothyronine, it increases energy and protein metabolism rate as well. So both thyroxine, T4, and triiodothyronine, T3, they do um, overlap one another in terms of their functionality. Calcitonin regulates calcitin, calcium metabolism, and it works with the parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. So calcitonin, important for calcium regulation. And you would have seen calcium regulation, particularly important for muscle contraction back in SNF1. So the parathyroid hormones, four glands, and they secrete the uh, parathyroid 
hormone. Let's have a look and see where they are at. So these are the parathyroid glands, one, two, three, four, located posteriorly, as it could be seen from the diagram itself. Calcium metabolism, when we're looking at it, it requires calcitrol, dihydroxycholecalciferol, -col shortened for name calcitrol, and it's produced by modifying vitamin D in the liver, then in the kidney. So that's a rule in terms of calcium balance. You have modification of vitamin D occurring in both the liver and in the kidney itself. Let me ask a question. Which gland secretes triadotyronine to help increase the metabolic rate in cells? So which one does it? Hmm. Thyroid. Thank you. Thyroid. Yeah. The thyroid gland. That's the one that does it. Okay. So we looked at the pituitary gland. We look at its functionality. We look at the types of hormones which are secreted at different levels in the, within the body itself. Now let's look at a different topic in terms specifically at the adrenal glands. So we looked at a few. Let's get into a little more detail. Adrenal glands. And these are the two small glands on top of the kid kidneys. And just like the structure of the kidney itself, it has both a medulla and a cortex, as seen in that diagram. Now, the hormones, very important from the adrenal medulla, epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is the American and the English, they say adrenaline and noradrenaline. So this is important, also known as the fight, flight, or the hormone associated with reproduction. So during the reproductive process, epinephrine in the adrenaline is secreted. All right. So, all right. So, other hormones which are secreted from the adrenal cortex include cortisol. Cortisol very important in regulating body fat, aldosterone, and the sex hormones as well. Let's move on to the pancreas. Pancreas, two major ones, insulin and glucagon. And insulin and glucagon, they have virtually opposite effects. Insulin, it lowers the blood sugar level and glucagon increases blood sugar level. So in other words, when your blood sugar level is high, insulin is secreted, it lowers it by causing reabsorption into the cells. And with glucagon, it increases blood sugar, causes the breakdown and secretion of sugars into the blood itself. So do remember in terms of the effects, insulin and glucagon, they have opposite effects, but they are both secreted by the pancreas, depending on the needs of the body itself. So this is just a, a, a microscopic slide, just showing the uh, a section through the pancreas itself. And this is just the islet shown here and the blood vessels uh, in terms of the section through the pancreas. Okay, so the sex glands. Ovaries and testes produce hormones to develop sexual characteristics. We'll speak more, more into more detail of this um, when we are looking at reproduction in the next four weeks, all, all right? So in terms of the sex glands, you have male and female hormones being released, testosterone in males and female estrogen and progesterone predominantly. Doesn't mean testosterone is not secreted uh, within females. So don't really think it's a male or a female hormone per se, that testosterone is let's say exclusively male or exclusively female. It's just that predominantly testosterone is secreted in male and predominantly estrogen and pre progesterone in females. But you'll be pleasantly surprised to note that of course they are produced, estrogen and progesterone are produced in males and at very low levels and similarly for females. However, in some instances, you do have females having higher than usual levels of testosterone and is included um, in the um, presentation I sent to you on WhatsApp in the lecture itself. Uh, there's always some controversy surrounding um, Olympic athletes. And most of the time, it has to do with a bias, I strongly believe, you know, towards um, athletes from the continent itself, right? So we ask ourselves because, uh, and in terms of, of their proof that what they bring, the IOC, for instance, is very, very shady. 
And to me, it, it's, it's, it slaps really of um, racism in terms of the judgments given to persons of color as it relates to these things. Two persons come to mind, uh, Samaya, a South African runner, and there's also an Indian runner as well. The only reason why the Indian runner was really allowed to continue is because she had a battery of lawyers, a cadre of lawyers that took the IOC to court, right? And they backed down, right? But Samaya, uh, even though the Indian athlete offered her lawyers, you know, to assist her, she did not go that route. And um, she was forced to take some home, um, tablets to actually decrease her naturally high levels of testosterone. All right? You can read more, of, you can have a look at more of that in the presentation which I sent to you on WhatsApp. Anyhow, let's go forward. So male testosterone, female as predominantly estrogen and progesterone. All right, so what is the name for the male sex glands? All right, these, of course, will be the testes. And why are the testes located outside of the body? As we will learn when we look at reproduction, because lower temperatures favor um, sperm production. Okay, so the next gland we want to look at the thymus gland, and the thymus gland, the thymus gland is a mass of lymphoid tissue, and it's very important for immune, immunity, because what it does is assist in the maturity of the T lymphocytes. So the thymus gland, very importantly as well, thymus begins with T, and the T lymphocytes, hence the reason why, because they mature in the thymus, hence the reason they're called T. They are B lymphocytes as well, uh, which we looked at when we were examining immunology, and they're called B lymphocytes because they mature in the bone marrow. The pineal gland, oh, very important, pineal. It's a cone-shaped structure, and it produces melatonin. Melatonin, very important to regulate our sleep and wake cycle. Huh. What do we mean by our sleep and wake cycle? Somebody can help me out with that. What do we mean when we say we have a sleep and wake cycle? Anybody? Sir, that is a cycle that is a rhythm is the circadian rhythm. Yeah. And or it's the body's internal clock. Yeah, very good, Natasha. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. We have an internal clock, OMG. What do I mean by we have an internal clock? Experiments were done with persons in which they got volunteers, let's say about, they got, you know, a group of, well, usually they get them with college students. So they got them and they placed them in a room that didn't have visual cues to let you know what time of the day it is. Visual cues, you know, when you look outside and you see sun, well, you know, it's not six o'clock yet. When you see dark, okay, we know it's after 6 p.m. So they, they didn't have, it, the, the, the building that they, or the rooms that they had them in didn't have any windows. So you know, they were given food, access to food and so on, um, all through the experiment. So that was not an issue. And they were allowed to sleep and for any amount of time. But again, too, as I said, in terms of if there was no fixed time to say, well, okay, we bring in breakfast, lunch, or dinner. You know, food was always present there for them, like a buffet. So, you know, they could um, get it at will and they could sleep at any time. And what they found was, and, and this occurs with us, with any humans that you run the trial on, that after, okay, yes, after about the first two days, your sleep pattern will be irregular, which means you might, let's say, get up at two, you know, go to bed at four. 4 a.m. and then let's say get back up at 12 noon and then go back to bed and so on. But after about two days, what happens is all of with all of the subjects what they found. Now all of these persons are separate, right? They're, they're, they're separate and so on. What they found was that all of them started to um, sleep, go to bed at around the same time and also wake at the same time. So they would go to bed. Now, mark you, there's no way, they don't have any knowledge of time. 
right? So they don't know what, 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 and they have no exposure to the outside. They can't see anything. But they still went to bed at around, let's say, 8 p.m. And they would get up around 5, 6, 5 or 6 p.m. after about two days. And it points to the fact that, um, as Natasha mentioned, there's, you have an internal clock, literally. And the mechanism is quite interesting how it works. But all that to say, the pineal gland, through the intervention of melatonin, it regulates that clock. So internal clock regulated by the pineal gland. And that clock is very important because could you think of anything within our bodies that has to be regulated by a clock, not only the sleep-wake cycle, but also in women, menstruation, right? Very important in terms of that clock. Once you have a regular cycle, it's under control. Something has to be timed. You know, why is it that, you know, for persons who have regular menses, why it is, you know, how does it happen so regular? There must be some timing mechanism. And all of that is under the purview or under the control of the pineal gland. Other hormone producing tissues located um, within the stomach, the digestive tract, the kidneys, brain, atria of the heart, and placenta as well. All right, which endocrine gland is also known is also called the hypothesis and is which one is the master gland. So when you hear master gland, which one comes to mind? Pituitary. Pituitary gland, right. That's the master gland. Very good. All right. So the last thing we want to talk of is a group of hormones made by most body tissues, and this would be prostaglandins. And they are produced close to the area in which they act. And what do they cause? They cause constriction of structures on dilation, and they also promote inflammation. Some of the things that hormones are, are used for, well, they could be extracted from animal tissues and genetically engineered. As we know, one of the more important ones is insulin. And this has been a boon for a lot of persons. It's produced artificially. But previously, for persons, for persons who had diabetes uh, type 2 and they needed insulin, let's say if you were to go back in the 1920s, where do you think they got the insulin from? Anybody wants to guess? Make a guess. Very close, very close. They would go to the abattoir and um, they would remove so them from, from pigs. Yeah, from pigs. They remove it from the pigs. So you're very close. I like how you were thinking there, your thought process. All right. So they just remove it from animals. So they would go to the abattoir, collect the um, pancreas. I don't know why it's the plural of pancreas, but they would collect all the pancreas from the um, uh, butchered animals and they would extract insulin from it. So it used to be exceptionally expensive, but now it's a lot cheaper because of the fact that it could be genetically, um, it could be artificially created. Okay. Hormones and stress as cortisol and cortisol when it's relieved in, re, sorry, when it's um, released in moments of stress, cortisol is associated with increase in um, weight and belly fat in particular. All right. Now I just want, so that's the first presentation for today. I want to um, just show you another present. Um, I just want to show you this, another angle of it. And I would send this to the, this is five minutes and it shows you a TED talk, very important on speaking to how hormones work. Now you don't, you would not be hearing it, but I would have the, um, the text on, so you just have to read along, okay?
Okay. All right. So, yeah. So that that's that big, pardon. Go Can ahead. You, after that video, we it wasn't. It didn't have audio. No. So okay. it was just showing. Yeah. So that's why I, I had the um. The, the subtitle, the captions on, yes. So, but okay. I, I would send the link for you so you could listen to it and hear it. I have to get an external speaker where, where I am here. And so then I could probably feed feed it through to you. But other than that, yeah, you don't get it. It doesn't, um, it doesn't give sound. All right. Okay. It's a, it's a, all uh, right, it's a very interesting one. It, it caps, it takes everything in and it, it lasts just five minutes. All right. Okay, so that, that was the first one in terms of the endocrine system. Now let's look at the second one. All right. All right, so we're going to look at metabolism. Everybody seeing it? Yes. Yes, sir. All right, let's go. Great. Come on. Come on. There we go. So metabolism, nutrition, uh, well, specifically metabolism, we'll be having a look at. Let's go. So it has, when you think about metabolism, it has really two categories associated with it, catabolism and anabolism. As the name implies, catabolism is the breakdown, anabolism is the building up. How I remember it, ana and kata, which one is which? When I think about a cat, you know, a cat is usually... I'm not a cat person, but from what I know of cats, they like to rip things up, you know, rip up your curtains and so on. So that's how I, I draw the parallel with cat and, you know, ripping up or destroying or break down of things. And then by um, method of elimination, the other one, anabolism, would be associated with the building up. So in what uh, we mentioned previously that the importance to us of actually eating is really to produce energy. This energy is released from the nutrients in a series of reactions. And one of the important things in terms of a number of studies was done, it was related to glucose. So glucose, which is a six carbon sugar, it releases uh, to ATP at the level of the cytoplasm. So this you could consider this a cell we're looking at. This area here is the cytoplasm, and here is the mitochondrial area. Anaerobically, within the cytoplasm, you have two ATP being released when glucose is broken down to pyruvic acid, two molecules of pyruvic acid. This pyruvic acid is then shuttled into the mitochondria, where further breakdown occurs, which yields, well, approximately 30 to, 30 to 34 ATP. So collectively, what you have happening uh, in terms of the production of ATP within a cell, you have 34 to 36 ATP being produced per molecule of glucose that is broken down. Let's have a look a little bit in a little more detail. The anaerobic phase occurs in the cytoplasm and it yields the end product of breaking down glucose. So it's broken down in a series of reactions, glucose to glucose 6, to fructose, fructose 1, 6, diphosphate, glycerol, di 3 phosphate, and ultimately going down to pyruvate, 2 by 1, 3 phosphoglyceric acid, 2 by 3 phosphoglyceric acid, and then to pyruvate. So pyruvic acid, or pyruvate as it's called, this now is shuttled into the mitochondria. It moves. So the pyruvate is formed by a series of enzymatic breakdowns in the cytoplasm. When you have pyruvate, it moves towards the mitochondria and it enters the mitochondria. 
within the mitochondria now you have the oxy the aerobic phase and this yields approximately 34 to 36 atp per glucose molecule and the end product is carbon dioxide and water question what is the name given to the series of reactions that releases energy is it catabolism or anabolism Um, catabolism catabolism breakdown where does the anaerobic phase of glucose breakdown take place in the cell so the anaerobic phase where does it take place cytoplasm yeah <laughs> yeah in the cytoplasm yeah that's right so anaerobic so just remember that and again, too, because you can look at it this way. Anything about the mitochondria, energy, yeah, it, it needs energy. I'm sorry, it needs oxygen. So any mitochondria, oxygen needed. So that's the aerobic phase. The anaerobic phase occurs in the cytoplasm, the liquid portion of the cell itself. So glucose comes in, it's broken down to pyruvate, right, by a series of reactions. Glucose, bam, 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 bam. End product is pyruvate. Pyruvate sent into the mitochondria. And there you have two things happening. One, the Krebs cycle occurring in the cytoplasm, cytoplasm matrix of the mitochondria. And then you have the electron transport chain, which is an inner portion of the mitochondrial matrix. Long story short, at the level of the mitochondria, you, this is where most of the ATP is produced. And that is why, as we are aware, the mitochondria is responsible for making energy for the cell itself. Yeah. All right. So when we're thinking about our metabolic rate, this refers to the rate at which energy is released from nutrients in the cell. And as we get older, does it go up or down? Does it go up or down? So it goes down. It goes down, yeah, as they get older, right? Right, which is why, you know, met, but whenever you get questions related to this, do note that um, just collectively, as you get older, things slow down, including met metabolic rate, which is why, you know, oftentimes you wouldn't see 95-year-old granny run it well. Don't believe what you see on TV with granny, of course, that played by Nikki Crosby, but you wouldn't see them running up and down stairs or anything like that. Everything slows down. So the metabolic rate is one of the things as well, it decreases with age. Now, in terms of the nutrients, so glucose is our main source of energy and reserves are stored in the liver and muscles as glycogen. So one of the major storage, storage uh, means for glucose is glycogen and is stored in the liver particularly. Other energy sources, of course, include glycerol, which is um, and alcohol, fatty acids, and amino acids, which are breakdown products of proteins. Glucose, right? Glucose. Let's talk about now how that breakdown it is. So anabolism build up, catabolism breakdown. So anabolism, the essential nutrients, cannot be made by the body, and it must be taken in diet. And these include the essential amino acids. Nine out of the 22 must be eaten. Also essential fatty acids. They're called essential because the body can't synthesize them, including linoleic acid and a uh, linolenic acid. I just uh, what is meant when an amino acid is described as essential? It means that it is needed and cannot be synthesized by the body itself. The breakdown phase of metabolism is catabolism. Is that true or false? 
break down. So true? Yeah, very good. Yeah, cat. Remember the little story I gave about the cat? Right? Destroying things, break down. Catabolism is indeed that. Okay? So let's go forward. So minerals in terms of what, what do they do? So minerals are chemical elements important for structure of the body, balance, muscle contraction, nerve impulse contraction, we mentioned sodium and chloride, very important, blood clotting, they assist in terms of the cascade associated with the formation of a thrombus. And some of these vitamins, not resulting minerals, but vitamins, they're either water soluble or fat. Anybody knows what's the water soluble and fat soluble vitamins? DECA, D-E-K-A, or vitamin A, D, E, and K. Are they fat soluble or water soluble? I'll give you a hint. Thank you. Well done. Fat soluble. So D, E, K, A, those are the fat soluble ones. And the others, they are water soluble. Very good. So in terms of how much um, of these different nutrients we need, well, you do have a certain percentage that is given, but it varies from time to time. And what we really need in terms of getting an update is really to check at the um, uh, updates are provided periodically, but have a look at the American Dietary Guidelines as it relates to these different nutrients and the quantities that we are needed. So what is the normal range um, for blood glucose? The normal range of blood glucose within the, within the blood is 85 to 125. And normally, of course, it is regulated by glucagon and insulin in terms of if it's too low or if it's too high. Right? If it's too high, insulin kicks in. And if it's too low, glucagon kicks in and causes the release of sugars into the blood itself. So fats. Are fats important? Yeah. We looked at fats when we were looking at digestion. We mentioned that fats are transported through the lacteals because of their size. Fats are generally big and bulky, and they can't fit through the capillaries because of the fact that capillaries are what, approximately 29 micrometers in diameter. And the lacteals, or the both the lacteals and the lymphatic system, when you're looking at the diameter, it's approximately four times, four to eight times as, as wide. So which is why fats preferentially are transported through the lacteals, as opposed to going through capillaries. It runs the risk of clogging up. Proteins, uh, most animal proteins are supplied from essential amino acids. Vegetarians, where do vegetarians get their proteins from? Do we have any vegetarians here or persons who eat a lot of uh, plant-based diets? Where do you get your proteins from? Anybody? Um, peas and beans. Peas, and very peas good. And... Peas and beans, right. Anywhere else? Other than peas? Simmering. Knock me over with a feather, really. I, I, I know of the moringa that plant is a quote-unquote miracle plant, right? Um, is it, does it, when you say moringa, does it refer to the leaf or fruit? Does it, does it make a, I know it's a leaf. The, the leaf and the fruit, sir. I didn't have, I didn't, okay, okay. And it's high in protein. All right, all right, good, good. I, I don't know if for some of us um, at one time, not at one time, currently at Burger King, they have this thing called the Impossible Burger. And um, it tastes just like meat. But according to them, it's made from plant. I find it. <laughs> So if ever you do um, happen to Burger King, um, just ask them about the impossible, the impossible Whopper, you know. And but this thing it is a patty, or it's a burger made of patties, but this thing tastes just like meat. But according to them, it no meat is involved. It's plant based. Um, so uh, yes. you could use um lentil peas and other correct. peas to make patties correct. as well. Correct. Correct. And for the vegetarians here, oh yes, there's a plethora of things. And even um, in terms of using carrot, um, beets, and a whole, all of those vegetables in different combinations and so on. But yes, lentils in particular, that is used as a base for a lot of burgers, quite so. Thanks for bringing that up, David. All right, supplements, vitamin and minerals. 
some people do believe that they are very um, taking taking them in, in certain amounts is preferential for health. There was a Nobel Prize winner um, who actually believed um, strongly in this. Right? Um, uh, that vitamin C, high levels of vitamin C is essential for long life. Right? And he was a, br a brilliant scientist. In fact, he was the he got his Nobel Prize in chemistry and he went on further to get, to get a Nobel Peace Prize as well. And um, he believed strongly in the fact that vitamin C, taking high levels of vitamin C, will in fact extend your life. I hear what you're saying. So how old he was when he died? I want to say he was in his 80s. So maybe there was some truth to that um, in terms of vitamin C. One of the good things with vitamin C what we do know, vitamin C is a water-soluble um, vitamin, which is why, for instance, if you drink a lot of pineapple juice or if you eat a lot of citrus, what will happen? What will you notice when you go to the bathroom? Anybody? If you take a lot of citrus or if you drink pineapple juice in particular, where you go? The urine is yellow in color. It's yellow in color. And what else? Anything else in particular? When you go to pay the water bill, what, what do you notice? Maybe you didn't pick it up, but sometimes what happens is the urine actually smells. It smells like pineapple, or it smells like orange, or it smells like putigal. I don't know if anybody ever you know, um, experienced that. I guess, okay. But you must give it a try sometime. If you have a Somebody bring a crocus bag, a putty gal home by you. Sit down and eat half. And then when you go to the bathroom, have a smell. And you'll notice that your urine actually does smell. I say this in jest. Please do not go and eat a half sack of crocus, a half crocus bag of Portugal's. But if you do eat or drink, let's say, um, pineapple juice, in, pineapple juice in particular, I don't know why, but it has a high... Um, probably flavor profile, as they say. It comes out in your urine. You'll smell it. You know, when you go to the bathroom, you'll get the smell of pineapple in your urine. Um, calories that should come from fats. These numbers change all the time. So, mm. all right. So the food pyramid guide, I'll just speak briefly to that one. The US Department of Agriculture, they, they published this. So it's updated all the time. This one is from 2006 but they do have updated one. Alcohol, is alcohol a nutrient? No, it's not. Awesome. No, no, right? Some persons, um, they do have, al you must recognize alcoholism is a disease, right? Um, some people are, they do have a weakness towards it. I know my grandfather was an alcoholic. Um, and uh, I think maybe when he passed, uh, it, in the family tales, it was rumored that he would, um, you know, have a violent temper and he would beat my grandmother, you know, at times. So he passed when my father was oh, nine years old, quite young. And I don't think a lot of people were too sad when he passed, God rest his soul, you know, because of the fact that he was prone to bouts of, you know, um, these, these bouts of anger that he would have when he would drink. So do recognize, however, that it is a disease, you know, and if you do know you're susceptible to it, well, just don't drink, if, if that could be the case. Um, one of the cases I often quote is of the legendary Manchester United footballer, George Best, who was a phenomenal player back in the 60s. Phenomenal. Um, his lifestyle, however, the one that he lived, Led was one of wine, woman, and song. And he would drink a lot. He had a weakness. He was an alcoholic. And li he literally drank himself to death. His liver failed. Days after his playing career, his liver failed. He got another one. They told him, listen, if you continue along this line, you will pass as well. He was like, all right. He stopped drinking for three years. And then he went right back in. And he subsequently died at a relatively young age of 54, 56. Right? But he was a phenomenal talent. But as is sometimes the case, you know, persons who are phenomenal talents, they usually have a weakness. And in his, his case, the weakness was alcoholism. All right, so do remember, alcoholism should be consumed in moderation. 
because it does interfere with your metabolism. So as you age, what happens? Everything slows down, right? Nutritional deficiencies may occur and medication may interfere with appetite and absorption. Body temperature, heat is a byproduct of chemical activities in body tissue and regular devices keep body temperature constant within narrow limits. Heat production as a result of exercise, which is one of the things you would recognize your body temperature goes up, food intake and age. One of the things also to take note of as it relates to age, um, what are hot flashes? Anybody, what are hot flashes? So in a, some kind of um, reaction that women get when they are going through um, menopause. Menopause, thanks Natasha. Menopause or post-menopause, um, menopausal women, right? They have these um, bouts where literally they feel hot. They're called hot flashes. So imagine you're in an air-conditioned room, fan on you, everything looking good. And then all of a sudden you, you just start, your temperature starts to go up. In some cases you would start to uh, sweat and you, you have to, you know, if, and people find it strange, you know, why air condition on and you want even, you know, more fans to be placed on you. Usually it just lasts for a period of about five minutes, five to 10 minutes, but this onset of these flashes, these periods where you do feel heat, right, coming uh, in your body, uh, to your body itself. So that's usually occurs with postmenopausal women after, men after menopause, after they've gone through menopause. All right, so heat loss in the body itself, the majority of heat occurs via conduction, radiation, and these processes. Wouldn't get into too much detail because we're really, we really putting the focus on nutrition. So we'd stop here as it relates to uh, this topic. So we looked at both today, we looked both at um, hormones and also at nutrition. Let's have a look now at some questions and see what we could, um, we could do. Let's answer a couple of questions on the topic just to reinforce our knowledge, okay? Okay. Okay, so let, let's go, all right? So let's have a look at these. So first question, the quickest, most readily available source of energy for the body. Which one is that one? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, and carbohydrates are nothing more than uh, complex sugars. Quite right, yeah. 
All right, so carbohydrates, complex sugar, B. Which of the following is not considered to contain carbohydrates? Hmm, this is an interesting one. So I would say candy. Simple. Um, candy. So one of the ways you could tell if it has a sim if it's a simple carbohydrate, it tastes sweet, very sweet. You get the taste immediately. If it has you know, complex carbohydrates, it doesn't taste sweet, it's more bland. So based on that, which one do you think does yeah, not... The bread? The bread, yeah. But mark you, if you do leave, let's say, bread or a biscuit on your tongue for extended period of time, it does get sweeter. It tastes sweet. But that is because the um, digestive enzymes in your mouth, in your saliva, is actually breaking it down. So the answer here is indeed bread. All right, next one, 63. Um, some dietitians label something as empty calories. We didn't speak to this, so I'll give the answer on this one. That's simple carbohydrates. Let's go to the next one. Which of the following types of food may reduce the risk of colon cancer? And this, in fact, it helps with digestion because it slows fiber. down. Fiber. Wow, what you're saying? Wow. You're on top. Yeah, fiber. And that is very, very important, which is why, you know, just drinking um, sodas and um, juices all the time. Yeah, that's good. If you had a choice even between, let's say, just drinking orange juice, orchard, or, or what have you not, no disrespect to Nestle and the other manufacturers, as opposed to sucking an orange. When you suck an orange, you get pulp. And the pulp actually, since it might sound, when it does go down in your colon, it slows down the absorption as it goes through the small intestine. It slows down the absorption of the um, sugars. So it's, it's absorbed more slowly. Therefore, you don't get a spike in your blood sugars. But if you just drink the juice, psh, it just go run, literally goes through and is absorbed very rapidly. So always remember fibers are important. Let's go to uh, 66. What are organic compounds that the body is, body is unable to produce but uses for its own, for metabolic purposes? Which one is that? Minerals. Minerals. You mentioned minerals. Yes, that is true. But um, let me see. Organic compounds. Mineral, are they organic? Do they contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? Mm, depending on the mineral, no, no, they wouldn't. Because if you're looking at specific ones, they wouldn't necessarily contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if you're looking at, let's say, sodium uh, chloride, you know, it, it wouldn't contain it. It doesn't contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen specifically. So what would be the other one which we looked at? So it's not minerals, but instead. And we mentioned it is known as the essential. So vitamin. Thank you. Yeah, vitamin. Well done. Yeah, the vitamins. All right. So minerals in and of themselves, they don't. When it say organic compounds, organic compounds are really classed as having carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in them. And in minerals, though they might have it, they predominant. Predom most of them don't. So that's why you're looking at the vitamins. Um, we didn't. 67, we that is beyond the scope of the class. So that's not only syllabus. Let's look at 68. Citrus fruit and other fresh fruits and vegetables are natural sources of which one? Which vitamin? C. C, yeah, C. Oh, what you're saying is yes? Yes. Right. So vitamin C indeed. Too much of what can cause kidney stones. Very interesting. Huh. Yeah, I think you're yeah, answering the wrong one just now. I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. You're right. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this one is sunshine and irradiated, irradiated milk are primary sources of. But we're talking about milk here. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thanks for pointing it out to me. Right. So milk, as you know, is a very good source of vitamin D. Interestingly, what can cause kidney stones? What it has shown is that vitamin C could cause kidney stones, right? Vitamin C, too much of it, um, which is rather interesting because 
water soluble vitamin it's a water soluble vitamin and is passed out in your urine but that, that is why they say everything in moderation let's go to the next one vitamin d deficiency what is this cause vitamin d malformation of so rickets rickets yeah <clears throat> A is night blindness or xerosalmia, B, beriberi, and C, scurvy, and D, of course, um, is rickets. So, you know, persons, they have weak bones in that regard. So, <laughs> based on just what I said, vitamin C deficiency can lead to? Scurvy, sir. Scurvy, quite right. And this was, a, this, this was something that would affect sailors a lot particularly English sailors. So what did they do? They would often uh, carry lines with them on board um, vessels. Right? And um, so because they found that, you know, when they sucked these lines, they actually didn't get scurvy, uh, which is why to this day, uh, English sailors are often known as limeys. They call them limeys. And the reason why is because they would carry limes on board to prevent scurvy. All right, let's go. Which of the following is not correct in regards? Let's look at 75. Which of the following is not regard, is not correct in regards to calcium and bone? In older individuals, blasts are more active than glass. Huh. That one is not true, right? It's the other way around. The class, because everything is slowing down. So therefore, the class are more active than the osteoblasts. Let's look at 76. I like that one. Which of the following, have a read through. Which of the following is not correct about dieting? So A? A is reduced while the same level of my, oh, that one actually is true because I see what they're saying is when the loss, weight loss occurs, if you, so other, if you stop eating as reduce the amount of calorie intake while the same level of activity is maintained, right? It's a, it's a poorly worded question. I mean, so if you're comparing it to your normal state, but it's badly worded. In fact, I find a lot of these statements are badly worded. But the one that I really wanted That's to hear to B, yeah. And why is B wrong? So A, I, I see where you were coming from with regards to A, why you said A. And I, I personally, I don't like how this question is worded it, because it is too am ambiguous. But the best one really is B. Um, and you, you want to give a reason why B? Anybody? Because this whole notion, um, lose weight rapidly, right? You'd want to keep it, you want to modify the behavior, but lose the weight gradually, not rapidly. Because it has been found, when you lose it rapidly, you put it back on just as fast. But if you modify behavior where it comes off slowly, it's something that is usually kept up better. But those rapid weight loss, you know, on TV, I lost 50 pounds in three weeks. Wow, what they have found in terms of follow up, yeah, most of the people put it right back on because of the fact is something in terms of getting it done in a very short space of time is not something quote unquote normal. So it's better to get the weight off gradually. And the studies have shown when you get it off gradually, you actually keep it off long term. All right. Okay, let's go forward. 
Um, ooh. That's a good 77. Mm, not on the syllabus. I'll double check in there. 78. Which of the following is characterized by an individual who has the habit of eating and then purging by um, vomiting? Bulimia. Yeah, bulimia. So uh, yes, anorexia nervosa. Yeah, correct. Okay. Right, but this one is bulimia. So persons, you know, they would eat. So they would, socially they appear normal, but usually right after they they'll just excuse themselves from the table, and they go to the um, bathroom, and um, take their fingers, push it to the back of the throat, initiate any gag reflex, and everything is brought up what they just ate. Right, so rather rather special in that regard. Let's go backwards from 87 up. Fat should be avoided in the diet, true or false? False. Whenever you get questions like this, always remember a nice rule of thumb, absolutes doesn't exist. Or absolutes are not really good things in science or medicine for that, for that matter. So if you see a question asking you about something absolute, you know, fat should be avoided in the diet. Yeah is usually false right whenever you see things ab that make absolute statements you know should be avoided doing fats is usually false let's look at the next one most of the calories in diet come from carbohydrates so we get most of our calories from sugars or complex sugars the answer is yeah we do yeah, yeah. It is necessary to maintain a constant level of glucose in the blood because brain cells cannot metabolize other sources of energy. And that is very, very true. Right? They use glucose, which is why you have to be taking it in. I think I brought this up last time that how prior to taking common entrance or SCA, when my days was common entrance, um, we, you know, it was a rule of or rite of passage. You know, like about the day before, or like the week, well, yes, yeah, about a day or two before, mother would carry us to the um, pharmacy and buy these glucose tablets. And nothing more, it looked like sweets, you know, but it was this big thing. You know, when you see, you get like two packs of glucose tablets, it's like, what? So you have that in your pocket with you, of course, when you go to the exam and you would take it. Was it successful enough or not? Mm, I don't know. I don't know, but thus far, I guess it hasn't, it didn't fear me too badly when I took my common entrance exam. So maybe there's some truth to it. I don't know. Let's go forward. Essential amino acids are those that are required in the diet because the body is unable to produce them. Is that true? Yeah, that's why they're called essential. They're called essential because of the fact the body cannot produce them. All right, two more. A nutrient is a substance that is used by the body. A nutrient is a substance in food that is used by the body for the maintenance of health. Is that true? Yes, sir. It surely is. Well done. And obesity is defined as a body weight of more than 20% of the ideal weight. That, according to the definition, is indeed true. Ah, since we already at 80, let's have a look at this. High sodium intake has been linked to hypothyroidism hypotension in some people. Is this true or false? True. True, sir. True. All right. So this word hypotension. It's false. It's false. Oh, it's not, yeah. it's not, hypo means low. But yes, hyper, hyper, right? So high sodium intake, is there a link between high sodium and high blood pressure? Oh, yeah. So to make this statement correct, it would be low sodium intake has been linked to low blood pressure in some people. But high sodium intake has been linked to hypertension. So it is why, you know, everything in moderation. What else could we use other than salt to get that same kind of quote unquote salt taste, you know, in foods? Anybody, if you have any, anybody knows? What else could give a sensation like salt without the salt?
well, I want to say citrus, you know, so using like lime and so on, it does give um, a salty or it gives you that, um, that salt sensation. Feel yeah, that zest. Yes, in terms of seasoning with it. All right. Okay. So we would stop here for today. Let me um, stop the recording. Mm-hmm.